So this session is going to look at the view from outside Trisana Hills. So basically the whole geopolitical change and the shifts that we are seeing and India's role within that. This session is going to be moderated by Rahul Sharma, past president and co-founder of PAFI. We also have Harish, also a co-founder of PAFI and a past president. We also have Samiran from Twitter. And we have, of course, Dr. Sanjay Baru and uh, Ambassador Arun Kumar Singh as our key panelists for this particular session. So with over to that, over to Samiran. Thank you. Uh, Deepak, uh, welcome back to the uh, PAFI Annual Summit 2022. Uh, we are starting session seven, which is uh, <clears throat> geopolitics view from outside Raisina Hill. Uh, for those who do not know uh, me, I'm Samiran Gupta with, uh, I'm with Twitter. I head public policy and philanthropy for Twitter. Uh, we have a, a very interesting session coming up and this is about trying to understand how India's geopolitical stance has changed over the last uh, few years. And, uh, and, and we've seen this play out with, let us say, the COVID-19 uh, crisis, as well as uh, the ongoing uh, war in Ukraine. Now, joining us uh, on this panel today are two eminent speakers, Ambassador Arun Kumar Singh, a former ambassador to the United States. Uh, on my left is Dr. Sanjay Baru, uh, distinguished fellow, United Services Institute, uh, Institution of India. And of course, uh, this session will be moderated by Rahul Sharma on my right, uh, managing director of APCO Worldwide. The format of the session is conversational by design. And without further ado, let me request Rahul to take over and lead the session. Rahul. Thank you. Thank you, Samiran. And, uh, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your break. Uh, the last session was, of course, quite fascinating. Um, I'm hoping that this one would keep your interest alive. <laughs> but, uh, but I think where we are sitting today, it's, it's extremely interesting to see the world. And uh, the session is view from outside Raisina Hills. And Raisina Hills, we know what it means and where it stands. Uh, Let's, I thought, you know, quickly look at where the world is today before we get on to having a conversation with our two eminent guests uh, who have a very uh, interesting worldview. We were having a discussion inside before we, we got here while we were waiting for all of you to finish your coffee. Uh, so uh, let's, let's quickly look at where the world is today. And, and so there's a war in Europe. And there is a nuclear threat hanging uh, after the Russian president said that he is going to mobilize about 300,000 extra people uh, to go fight in Ukraine. We are still struggling with a global supply chain problem. It hasn't really fixed. Uh, China has slowed down. The global factory is not doing as much as it was doing. Uh, unlikely that it changes very quickly. What will China look like after October is still an open question because President Xi Jinping will start his third term unprecedented, uh, hasn't happened in a long, long time. So the China that we see today may not be the China we will see post-October. Uh, let's wait and see, but that's the big question mark there. Inflation is a concern globally. Interest rates are going up all across. The Fed did another trick last night, or was it yesterday? Uh, repercussions are being faced here. Rupee is dropping. Stock market isn't as much as it should, but that's for some others to comment on. Nations are becoming increasingly inward looking and increasingly nationalistic. So trade issues are becoming very different than they were a few years ago. We are in an increasingly, quote unquote, multipolar world. We are also facing huge climate issues, which are impacting economies. Imagine the longest river in China drying up. 
impacting hydropower stations, therefore no electricity for factories, no electricity for homes. Imagine the Rhine drying up in Germany, which means all the raw material that needs to be floated down the river to the factories in Germany, not happening. Uh, they, they, they found boats which sank in the Second World War coming up, which had never been seen for 70 years. And I haven't even mentioned COVID, if you realize. So COVID, let's put in the past, because obviously it seems to have gone away somewhere. Don't know where it came from. But if you look at it, uh, we do see some distance here, which I understand is to make sure that we are safeguarded against COVID, but you know, we are sitting next to each other. So this is where we are, uh, if you really look at it. It's a very, very challenging world. And in that space, uh, we are sitting in India. So where does India stand? Uh, what are India's options? Uh, it was very interesting to see the prime minister have that conversation with the Russian president the other day, uh, which some media in the West called a rebuke. Uh, was it from the position of strength? Was it not from a position of strength? How do we deal with a China, uh, which we know uh, has not been extremely friendly uh, for quite some time? India takes over the presidency of G20 uh, this December. So it's getting into a position where it can actually impact uh, the worldview, uh, the challenges, find some answers along with others. So what is it going to do? Essentially, where is the world going and what it means for India is the conversation that I would like to have with our two guests. Uh, and hear what they have to say and then get into a conversation and of course open up for questions as we go forward. So. Uh, Ambassador, let me start with you. There is a view, uh, okay, let's, let's look at the United States at the moment, right? Um, US has been trying very hard to wean India away from, quote unquote, its uh, friendship with Russia, etc. whatever is happening. How do you see that building up as we go, you know, given all the facts, all the things that we have discussed about? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Rahul. So uh, the relationship that uh, we've constructed with the U.S. for the past 20 years, uh, moving away from the sanctions they did in 1998 after our nuclear tests, has essentially been so far in the framework of a unipolar world where it was, the U.S. was dominant. And in that period, uh, the U.S. has moved to do a civil nuclear cooperation agreement with India, ending the nuclear apartheid for India, which has enabled India to access civil nuclear technology, other high technology from U.S., from Europe, source uranium from other parts of the world. Uh, the U.S. has declared India a major defense partner. It has now declared support for India's permanent membership of the U.N. Security Council. And... Uh, if you look at what's happening in the context of the Russia-Ukraine war, where clearly uh, there is not full convergence between the US and Indian approach, instead of being very severely critical of India, as would have happened in the past, uh, the US Secretary of State has said on a number of occasions that we understand that India's relationship with Russia developed at a time when the US was not willing to be that kind of a partner but that the U.S. is now willing to be that kind of a partner. And the National Security Advisor said that with India, we are playing the long game. So now from that phase, um, where clearly uh, not only we work to build cooperation, but now we are learning to manage differences. And I think that's, that's very important. Now we are entering a phase where, as you referred to, it is going to be a multipolar world where U.S. preeminence is going to be increasingly challenged by China, economically, technologically, militarily. It is today uh, on the ground being challenged by Russia, militarily. 
And so India has now to construct its relations in a framework where you have three major players in the global context, US, Russia, and China. And so with China, we have an adversarial relationship and it is likely to continue because if you see uh, the messages coming out in India, uh, including from the government, it's a sense that China wants to sustain pressure on India to reduce uh, space for India to be able to exercise its various options. So that's likely to, uh, to continue. And India's response uh, seems to be firmness on the ground and keep exercising your options. Don't give in uh, on that. So that is likely to continue. So on China, you have a convergence with the United States because the United States has declared that despite whatever is happening with Russia, it still sees China as its main long-term challenge. So that's an area where uh, there is potential for working together. That's an area where you can leverage a US interest in India uh, to access technology, uh, to make India part of supply chains, uh, where they're talking of secure supply chains, friend shoring uh, of production. Now the dilemma, the other part of it is that US is likely to have a very difficult relationship with Russia for quite some time. And one can even uh, foresee that it may be difficult for US and Europe to have any kind of relationship with Russia while Put President Putin is there. I mean, that's in the nature of things. So given that, I think uh, our relationship with Russia will be watched very closely in uh, Europe and particularly in the United States. Now, for our own interest, uh, we cannot really cut back on our relationship with Russia because it's a very strong defense partner. Uh, in the last five years, we have imported uh, more than 49% of our requirement from Russia, uh, more than 60% of our defense inventories of Russian origin. So if there's any squeezing on that, our capability to maintain our interest, uh, protect our interests on our borders would be compromised. Uh, Russia has also been an important energy partner. OVL has done huge investments in Sakhalin, which has worked very well for us. And in today's context, when there's an energy shortage uh, globally, when the Venezuelan oil has been taken off the market because of US sanctions, Iranian oil has been taken off the market because of US sanctions, and Europe is accessing Asian oil because it wants to cut back uh, on purchases from Russia, India has no alternative but to get Russian oil. So there is that aspect. And finally, uh, no country in the world takes decisions to help another country. Every country in the world takes decisions based on its own interests and based on the political compulsions and decisions on, of its leaders. So given that US decisions at various points of time need not be in convergence with India's interests. So in any case, you can never afford uh, to put all your eggs in one basket. You want to hedge, you want to maintain space for being able to take your own decisions. So I think um, as I look ahead, clearly our relationship with the US will consolidate. Because if you look at the economic interests, uh, the presence of Indian origin diaspora, technology partnerships, uh, for aspirations that we have related to India's growth, technological progress, the important international partner would be the United States. Uh, so while that is happening, you will need to maintain your relationship with Russia and find the convergence in the US, uh, uh, India uh, interests as far as China is concerned, but you will not be able to agree on everything and we will need to continue to learn to manage that difference. That will be the challenge. Sanjay, uh, you have uh, been very consistent about one of your views, which is if India really wants to matter, it has to have a better, larger, stronger economy. Uh, given where the world is today, uh, is that a challenge? We keep hearing India is growing, you know, we're growing at a pace which is, of course, much faster and higher than other countries in the world. The percentages do show that. But how do you see this bit shaping up in the next year, two years? Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me uh, begin by thanking Pafi and Ajay and Rahul for be, uh, inviting me here. I entirely agree with the remarks that uh, Arun has made, and therefore I will not repeat what he has said, particularly his conclusion. 
that you know we need to be dealing with us russia china let me make two observations particularly because i see a lot of young people uh, so, sorry particularly because i see a lot of young people in the audience and because so much of the discussion these days on foreign affair foreign policy happens in the media and we are all exposed to that i want to make two points one on your question about the relationship between india's economic size and its performance uh, and its position in the world about 22 years ago i was a member of the national security advisory board and i wrote a paper for them which has been published since called the strategic consequences of india's economic performance and the argument then which holds even today is that where india stands in the world depends on where india is as an economy and there is no getting away from that the fact is that from the year 1999 when the nsav reflected on these issues till the year 2015 16 roughly for about 15 16 years india was seen as a rising economy and therefore a rising power india slowed down in the last 3 4 years particularly and all projections for the next 2 3 years are that it can it will continue to grow slowly i think the average rate of growth for the last 3 years has been estimated at 3.8% and the average for the next 2 years is likely to be around 5 to 6%. So the 8 to 9% performance of the UPA period has slowed down. And with this slowing down at home uh, there are pressures developing particularly as you yourself elaborated about the world today oil prices going up conflict in europe etc china slowing down us slowing down japan slowing down all the major economies of the world are slowing down so there is a difficult economic situation at a time when we are not performing adequately well at home so the combination of a domestic economic slowdown and a global economic slowdown creates an economic environment in which our position is more challenging that's point number 1 but the more important point i would like to make this evening particularly in the context of the pressures that arun has spoken about you know what is happening in the world and your remarks about an emerging multipolar world please do not forget that even when india was a much smaller economy even when india's share of world uh, income was about less than 5% in the 1950s even when we are a developing country less de le developed country we had an independent foreign policy the foundation of indian foreign policy right through the period we call it non alignment was a strategy it was not about taking sides it was not about not taking sides it was about saying i'm not getting involved in this big power fight these two big guys are fighting soviet union and the us you know i'm not getting involved because for me the priority is economic development at home you read the statements of successive prime ministers including prime minister modi the fo the focus of indian foreign policy has always been india's economic development that is the one pole star and everything that we do internationally is focused on ensuring that the indian economy rises poverty goes down employment improves that india becomes a middle income power and then at some point a high income power that's the trajectory china took that's the trajectory we have been taking but through this entire period of the cold war when we were a smaller economy when we were a weaker nation when our military capability was much less we had an independent foreign policy we did not join any military alliance the west did not like it because they had pakistan on their side they had other countries in the region on their side we refused that the west accused us of being pro soviet we were not pro soviet we were simply 
depending on those countries that were willing to offer us support in our attempt to become a substantial global power. And during the Cold War, the Soviets helped us. Once the nuclear deal was done, and that was the fundamental significance of the nuclear deal, it was not about nuclear weapons, it was about a strategic partnership where the West finally came around to supporting India's economic development. But that doesn't mean we have given up independent foreign policy. So today when there is a conflict between Russia and the United States, it's essentially a conflict between Russia and the United States, our government has not taken sides. Because it is your problem. And I think Jai Shankar put it brilliantly in that Bratislava Globsec conference when he said, you know, Europe's problems uh, are not the world's problems. You sort it out. We have our problems, you didn't, uh, you know, come to us. The Indian position of taking an independent foreign policy has nothing to do with, you know, our external requirements and dependencies. These external requirements and dependencies exist and it is the intelligence of our political and diplomatic leadership that we have been able to use whatever power we have to address this. Right? Now, finally, I'd say that in the current contest, we are, you know, you use the word multipolar. Multipolar is a long way off. I think the world today, in my judgment, is best described as a bimultipolar world. In other words, it's not a unipolar world. There's no one power. But there are two powers, namely China and the US. But what is different about the bimultipolar world as opposed to the bipolar world, which was the Cold War era, uh, is that in the bipolar world, there are only two big powers. And everybody took sides, except the countries like India or Egypt, or everybody else took sides, right? Today, Countries are refusing to take sides. There is the United States, there is China, but there are a large number of countries which are in between. And they look to India to be able to stand its ground in dealing with these two big powers. So I think, so I think some analysts have called it a sweet spot. It's an interesting st st position that we are in where many countries, including in Europe, I mean France, for example, I would wager to say Germany, France, Japan, probably even Russia, these are all countries that do not want to be either in the American camp or in the Chinese camp for different reasons. And therefore are looking for space in between. And that's the opportunity we have. But to be able to use that opportunity, I go back to your question, we have to step up our rate of economic growth, our engagement, global engagement. We had a brilliant session before this on trade. We have to increase our share of world trade. We have to increase you know, our economic links with the rest of the world. And that's, that's what we need to do in order to be able to play the role that is being offered to us. Okay. Ambassador, I'll would you like to talk about this bi-multipolar world that Sanjay mentioned? How does that pan out in your point, in your view, one? And secondly, do you think India can rise to the challenge of actually being acceptable to others who are looking up to it and can show the way? No, I think uh, there are many countries today who are showing uh, interest in the India relationship. Uh, we saw, uh, already spoke about how the U.S. finds that it is in its own interest uh, to strengthen the relationship with India. Uh, because when, even when they did the Civil Nuclear Cooperation Agreement, uh, they did it on the basis of the understanding that uh, they were not able to advance the relationship with India because of the various technology denial regimes. And they needed to remove that and move uh, forward. But going beyond that, uh, just a few days ago, the French defense minister, uh, foreign minister, was visiting India. And uh, in uh, public comments, uh, she said that France is now ready for a no limits partnership with India. And of course, to some, that was a take on the uh, Russia China declaration of February 4 on a no limits partnership. 
and she also said that uh, we are ready for we are doing and ready for full operational coordination in the in the indian ocean uh, with india so um, i think uh, if you look at europe certainly uh, germany is interested in developing the economic partnership germany doesn't take so far much of a position on strategic aspect uh, but france is more active and uh, you saw also that um, we did recently uh, in uh, new york the india france uae uh, trilateral uh, and uh, and uh, again in july when president biden was visiting uh, israel uh, was the first uh, summit of the i2 u2 partnership uh, israel india uae uh, and the us where some concrete uh, projects uh, emerged from that including the projection of a 2 billion dollar investment by uae in india in food parks for export uh, to the gulf region and also in some uh, clean energy projects uh, then also uh, again you know as you've heard from indian leaders uh, they see india as playing a leading role taking off from what sanjay spoke about the independence Uh, in our foreign policy and being able to take its own decisions and in the framework of that um, india has been participating in the shanghai cooperation organization india is looking at uh, working with others to consolidate the north south corridor uh, which uh, links better india through iran uh, to russia to central asia india has been working on the chabahar port to enhance access uh, to afghanistan again and to central uh, asia so i think there are different options with japan we have a strong uh, partnership there is a india france australia trilateral uh, also that is being worked upon so i think uh, partly because of where we are located uh, partly because of the evolving china uh, challenge from china uh, to the global economic and technological order aside from the uh, political uh, order and i think the uh, the economic opportunity that countries see in india uh, i think they are certainly prepared and especially at this moment when there is all talk of reordering supply chains looking at a china plus uh, sort of uh, supply chain arrangement there is certainly uh, enhanced interest in india and that's that's visible so uh, interestingly um, one of the countries that we didn't really hear about for a long time but hear a lot about now and you mentioned it twice is the uae what is happening there i think uh, certainly for a long time the effort has been made but uh, uh, the present government has put a lot of effort in developing the uae relationship uh, the prime minister has i think visited there at least twice Uh, the um, present head of the uae earlier in capacity as crown prince had visited twice including a uh, chief guest on our republic day uh, uae is among the largest uh, single country presence of indian origin diaspora almost 3 million and because of the trade that takes place via uae again a very important uh, uh, point for uh, india's overall trade so important partner and again um, uh, if you look at the gulf you know where does pakistan derive its strengths from uh, historically from the us from china and from countries in the gulf so to the extent that you can make a dent there certainly uh, ha- it makes a difference and also in terms of counter terrorism cooperation uh, from the challenge that we've had from pakistan supported terrorism in the last several years Uh, various countries in the gulf including uae saudi arabia and others have handed over to india persons who have been identified as involved in terrorism so i think it's a very very important partnership that uh, we are looking at developing further and then there has been talk of the uae sovereign fund investing in india uae also partners partnering in the petrochemical project that is being worked upon in maharashtra so so in terms of financing in terms of markets in terms of the diaspora interest uh, uh, because again since we are a trade deficit country remittances from outside right. india are important and the gulf is an important uh, source of remittance so with all this it's a it's an important partnership sanjay uh, g20 uh, usually countries use the presidency to uh lot for domestic advantage 
in fact, both Saudi and Italy are great examples of what they did to, you know, internally uh, to showcase themselves as. How do you see India playing out the G20 bit? Because it actually has a great opportunity to take the leadership on many critical issues, you know, like whether it's climate change, whether it's technology, whether it's data, you know, all kinds of stuff that are being talked about. How do you see it sort of unfolding as we get into the presidency in the next few months? Well, there are two aspects to, uh, to the answer. One is G20. Uh, what, where is G20? The second is what opportunities India have? Let me answer the second one first. I think it's the first time that we are going to have all the major powers in India at the same time. We haven't had a summit like this for a long time. And uh, the fact that, you know, while it's G20, actually it's more than 20 countries and we are inviting about half a dozen countries. So about 30, 40 world leaders are going to be here, the heads of world institutions, IMF, World Bank. And therefore it's a major event. And it's quite understandable that the government will use the event in order to get a lot of publicity for itself, showcase India, showcase Delhi, showcase cities. That's the whole project. You know? So that's a, that's, a, that's a circus. So there's going to be a big circus in town, right? <laughs> and, and, and why not? I mean, every country that hosts uh, either an Olympic game or we, and we haven't hosted one, any major international event. And actually, Delhi hasn't hosted a major international event for some time. Um, so the circus is coming to town. But having said that, G20 as an organization has not delivered anything in the last five years. G20 came into being uh, in 2008, September, in the height of the uh, transatlantic financial crisis, the Lehman collapse, when the French re uh, out reached out to the United States and said that, look, there's a crisis, uh, Europe is in trouble, you are in trouble, what can we do about it? And both discovered that they could do nothing about it without China. They needed China. And there was already a G7, G8 had become G7 when Putin was thrown out of G8. So the option was for the transatlantic countries to go back to becoming G8 with China in, which the Americans didn't want. So then the French said, oh God, wait a minute, there's an outfit called G20 of finance ministers. Why don't we raise it to the level of heads of government? And that's how G20 came into being. And the first meeting in Washington, second one in Pittsburgh, or second one in London, third in Pittsburgh, three meetings of G20 stabilized the global economy, created new institutions. The global financial system was stabilized. New financial institutions were created, right? So the tremendous success. And I must add here that the hero of the first and the second summit was Manmohan Singh as confessed to by both uh, Obama and uh, J Gordon Brown. You know, he came up with the ideas. Or mo many of these ideas came uh, from Dr. Manmohan Singh. But that was the height of G20's success. After three years, G20 started looking for issues. So climate was one issue and you know, there's been some discussion on climate. But the other big issue which stares us in the face is trade. The WTO has failed and the global trading system is not functioning well. Yeah. The world is full of regional trade blocks and we are not member of any. And the G20 has refused to discuss trade. Consciously, trade is not an agenda item. So what are the agenda items? Well, climate change, yes, of course. Climate change, everybody wants to talk about. Uh, very few are doing much about it, right? Then COVID was there, so a couple of G20 meetings, thanks to COVID, they had some topic. Now, if you look at the agenda for what is happening in Indonesia, actually, let's wait for the Indonesia G20s next month, mm -hmm. October. Let's see whether Putin and uh, Biden will land up in Jakarta. She, you know, she will land up. I don't think the Americans have a problem meeting Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. But they've said they don't want Putin in the room. And if Putin lands up in Jakarta, will the West walk out? So if 
Jakarta G20 collapses, then unless the whole issue of Putin and the West is sorted out by the time we have our G20, it's going to be. God knows if G20 actually will be a functional organization. Well, the world has seen many such organizations which have come and gone. You know, sell by date is over. So, while at home we'll hear a lot about it, the, the, the big circus will go on. Whether the elephant will appear in the circus and the lion will appear in the circus, only the jokers will be running around the arena. Who <laughs> <One> doesn't know? <laughs> <laughs> Your view, sir. <laughs> of the G20. <laughs> you just heard one point of view. Let's hear yours. <laughs> no, so I broadly agree with what Sanjay said. <laughs> so I was present in Pittsburgh in 2008 when the first uh, G20 uh, meeting was held. And I think at that time, uh, Sanjay mentioned it was the initiative of the French who persuaded President George Bush to convene this because of the global financial crisis it, as it was playing out. And the sense was that the G7 economies on their own couldn't uh, deal with this. And so the first few meetings dealt uh, certainly with the financial crisis. And then there was this talk that the G7 uh, was no longer uh, the relevant international organization if you wanted to look at global economic cooperation and that the G20 needed to be uh, built upon. The major economies of the world were now uh, present there. And of course, while the G7 kept meeting, uh, it was seen more as a reflection of just Western interests, but the global economic discussions taking place in the framework of the G20. So it became a more institutionalized. Uh, but I think the last year has been a big challenge. In the last some months, uh, from what I understand, uh, G20 meetings have not even been able to come out with a statement uh, because there is no agreement between US um, and Russia in coming out uh, uh, with any kind of a joint statement. So, so the meetings have not really been productive. So if this continues, um, how we will handle it in the coming year will certainly be a challenge. But still the discussions are going on and if, even if the uh, joint statements don't come out. The very fact that delegations meet, exchange views uh, is important. Uh, we'll have to see how the Indonesian presidency handles this uh, for the summit and then certainly it will be a challenge for India to take it forward. But uh, as I can see from India's point of view, uh, through the G20 process uh, following the summit, uh, there will certainly be an effort to showcase uh, India. Um, uh, the technological progress, especially in digital technologies that's happening here, bring the focus back on the need for global economic growth uh, as it is impacted severely uh, by the consequences of the war uh, that's going on. And certainly uh, also look at issues uh, related to climate change and health. So that effort will certainly continue, but how it really plays out will be impacted by the uh, developments related to the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Sanjay, you, you talked a bit about trade. I was reading a very interesting article in the Foreign Policy magazine, and I'm just going to quote from that. It is fair to conclude that nearly two years into the Biden administration, we are in a new era in which economics no longer matters much. Instead, populist rallying cries about techno-nationalism reign supreme. The United States and other major economies are in defensive mode, ready to raise more trade barriers and tariffs if necessary. Who's winning the trade war between US and China? That's a tough question. I mean, as of now, both US and China need each other. And I keep saying this to Indian audiences. You know, whatever the rhetoric, the US and China still have an extremely important interdependent economic relationship. And that continues. The decoupling has not happened. So let us not only go by the rhetoric of US-China differences. You look at, I mean, you look at counterparts of yours in the US, you look at US chambers of commerce and business organizations. They're all lobbying for stability in US-China relations. Every time there's a hiccup in geopolitical hiccup or political hiccup, the businessmen come around and say, you know, help us. And Rahul and I edited a book uh, on 50 years of the Nixon visit and Kissinger visit to China. 
So let me do a small commercial for us. Uh, it's called <laughs> The New Cold War, uh, uh, The ro Role of Kissinger in the US-China Relationship, uh, in which we have recorded the role of American business in the US-China relationship over 50 years, and it continues. So all this talk of trade war, I mean, you know, on the ground, the material relationship remains. The problem is that the United States is a weakening economy. And China is a s economy that is still rising. It has Both have their own problems. China's growth has slowed down. But the fact is that the US economy in a long-term sense is on the decline. And China in a long-term sense is on the rise. And therefore there will be tensions. But despite these tensions, the relationship remains still very strong. And I think we in India have to be alive to this reality, rather than imagine that already a new Cold War has started and the two are on opposite camps and you know we have to take sides between the two. I don't think that game is going to take us very far. Sure. If I could just supplement a bit what Sanjay said, that uh, in the unipolar phase uh, since uh, 1990, uh, the U.S. pushed for globalization of production and trade because they felt they could do it in the framework of domination of U.S. Uh, industry and capital. And the whole talk was of efficiency in production. Uh, now, uh, as all the data has pointed out, the U.S. economy benefited. The elite in the U.S. benefited. The top 1% generated 40% of the income, 40% of the wealth. But the middle 40% of the population felt left out in this process. And there the death rates went up, income stagnated, uh, longevity came down, drug addiction went up, and that led to the Trump phenomenon. So as a result of that, the whole message from the US today is no longer we should talk about efficiency in production, but protecting jobs at home. And also uh, enabling the US worker to compete more effectively. And so the entire discourse on trade has changed because the domestic compulsion in the United States has changed because of the challenge that has come uh, from China. And so I think um, uh, going ahead, uh, the norms for trade, the projections related to trade will be very different from what we've seen in the preceding year. And uh, so I expect that the uh, US-China competition will continue. US will try to work out uh, norms of trade so that they can deal with the challenge from China which has used uh, the strength of its public sector uh, enterprises or the state-owned enterprises to uh, subvert rules in a way that they get unfair advantage. And so that needs uh, to be dealt with. So the technology restrictions related to China uh, will continue and, and will increase. You are seeing now talk of not only uh, sort of looking at Chinese investment in US, but US companies investing in China in certain technologies, we need uh, may need approval uh, from the U.S. Uh, government. So that's the direction. And again, another political message that's coming out from the U.S. is that they had uh, sort of engaged with China economically in the expectation that it will lead to political yeah. and economic liberalization in China. Yeah. And that has failed. And they had given up on that strategy. So I think we should expect some adjustment in the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, but we have to see how it plays out. Great. So uh, we are running short on time, unfortunately, thanks to the coffee break. <laughs> so put the blame on you guys. <laughs> so we don't really have any time to, for questions. But you know, Harish, uh, could I quickly ask you to for a word of thanks and then apologies for this? But thanks, Rahul. It's a fascinating conversation. Clearly, uh, the three major things that happened in the last two years is. COVID, the rise of China, and the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine have completely changed the world order. And clearly, as we came to the discussion, India will have an independent policy. Uh, and we'll have several bespoke uh, bilateral, multilateral, like ITU2, Quad, IPEF, etc. And in summary, it looks like what the Chinese would say, interesting days ahead. Uh, I want to end by thanking uh, all the panelists, uh, especially uh, Sanjaya, you've been with us for a long time from our humble day beginnings in the India Habitat Center to small room conferences. Uh, I know that you uh, share the same pride that we have as uh, 
faculty members and seeing the growth here to now doing this event in this big hotel occupying uh, three rooms, like uh, what a CI AGM would be. So we come a long way. It is all because of people like you who supported us uh, from the beginning. Uh, Ambassador Arun Singh, always a pleasure uh, interacting with you. You've also been interacting with PAFI. We look forward to your uh, continued association. Uh, with that, uh, I also have the present duty of asking uh, Rahul to hand over a memento to Ambassador Singh. Amiran and Harish, can you just all join for the group photo? in the front, please stay back. And this session, interestingly, is going to be more of a segue 